Welcome everyone to our June Graphic Arts Alliance webinar. Really pleased to have Jeff Perkins here from Kodak. Um, Jeff is in charge of digital, uh, digital equipment here at Kodak, and he's going to kick it off with some industry insights, let us know what's been going on in the digital print industry, uh, feature some of the Kodak products. Jeff's been in the digital printing industry for, he mentioned, a, quite a long time, most of his career. So yeah, he's, he's got a lot to share with us today. So yeah. Jeff, why don't you go ahead Thanks. and take it away? Great. Hey, thanks, Wendy. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks, everybody, for being on the call today. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance. I'm I'm tethered to my cell phone to do this presentation sitting in an airport. So the background things are getting really good. It doesn't look like you can even tell I'm in an airport right now. So um, what I want to do with you guys today with uh, Kodak next week is we're doing an innovation showcase. And at that event, we're gonna be launching three new products uh, or making the world the worldwide release of them, if you will. Um, two inkjet products and one uh, dry toner based product. And today I wanted to take you guys through two of the products. Um, uh, the Prosper Ultra 520, which is the 20 and a half inch web inkjet press. And then uh, the toner based product is really geared towards the light packaging and narrow width, like indoor POP signage industry. So, you know, as, as you guys have probably seen and everybody else, the, the cost of printing offset continues to rise with plate, plates, plates price increasing. Uh, the demand on paper, I, every, every person I talk to in this industry, the conversation usually starts with two things, um, people and paper. Um, it seems like it's a full-time job to source paper today and not just attracting a strong labor force, but also kind of that, that anticipation of the aging labor force looking to retirement. So we're, we're finding success in digital because the cost of print offset is continuing to rise. Um, and I'm happy to field questions at the end of this. Uh, as much as I can share, I'm willing to. So not too many slides. Um, I'm not a big death by PowerPoint guy. There is one video link in this and I really, really hope I've got enough bandwidth for it to come through for y'all. Um, if not, we'll just skip it. So the first product I'm really excited about is, is our 20 and a half inch web product. This will be a, the first entry point for Kodak um, in this web space, this width. Um, prior to that, we were 25.5 inches wide. And uh, that particular press was really geared more towards transactional, newspaper, um, some direct mail. But, but this press, based off of the same stream inkjet technology, really takes takes another step up in the quality. So I'll kind of walk through this with you guys, maybe. Hey, Wendy, it's not letting me advance. Uh, there we go. Oh, good. Got Great. it. So it, it did work. So we feel we're really closing the gap with offset with this press. I mean, we kind of checked the boxes here of all the things offset does really well. Extended runs, printing on glossy paper, high quality, high speed, uh, where offset struggles is short run work you guys know that as well as i do and obviously on variable um unless you mount inkjet heads onto a web press or something you know everything's static traditional inkjet what we call drop on demand which is all of the other competitive inkjet heads out there um whether it's piazza technology or thermal they all do some great things, but they do typically have some shortcomings. And one of them happens to be high quality print or high coverage at high speeds. Um, it's the physics behind the print head. Uh, those drops are, are dropping with gravity. And uh, <clears throat> the faster the web travels, the more degradation you get to the quality of the drop. And we'll go in and explain what differentiates us from the other technologies here in a second. And we kind of think we, we checked all the boxes or we did check all the boxes with this. This press is gonna run at rated speed all the time, 500 feet per minute. No matter how much you paint the sheet, 
uh, no matter what quality setting you're on. Um, and that includes glossy papers. Um, <clears throat> so here we go. This is a video. Let's see if this actually works today. All right, kind of. So this demonstrates our inkjet technology to, if you look on the left side of the screen, DOD technology. So we are we have pressure inside the inkjet head and we're jetting the dot down 10 times faster than a drop on demand technology, piazza or thermal. What that allows us to do is keep very round dot integrity, but it also allows us to let the web travel faster without sacrificing image quality. And at the end of the day, um, that's a big difference. You can see kind of on these magnifications with DOD, you could get some satelliting where the drops actually break off from themselves. That starts to affect the overall image quality. Hey, there's a picture of the press. Did that stream okay, Wendy? Um, it did. I don't know if there was sound with it, but the, the video came there was. perfectly. Okay, it was okay. Just, that's fine, but it was, we got the video part <laughs> perfectly. Good, good, good. Well, the music wasn't that great, so okay. you didn't miss much on that. <laughs> so really the net of this thing is, um, the best possible image quality for aqueous inkjet running at 500 feet per minute um, at rated speed all the time. We do not have to slow the web down. And one of the things we really tout is our total low cost of operation. Our ink pricing is substantially less than ma the majority of the people out there. Um, so it drives the operational cost down quite a bit. So what is it really? It's a 600 by 1800 DPI press. It's equivalent to about a 200 line screen. So the quality is very good. I, I, I laugh when this says, you know, compact and robust design. From unwinder to rewinder, it's about 46 feet. Um, our previous press, the Prosper 6000, somewhere around 98 feet from unwinder to rewinder. So we look at that as really compact. It's half the size. <laughs> We're going to manufacture two models. Um, the Prosper Ultra C uh, is geared more towards commercial printer applications with higher coverage that might be running on glossy stocks. The Prosper Ultra P, um, P standing for publishing, lower coverage. Um, I would want 90% of the substrate to be uncoated. Um, and it really has to do with drying, right? We have a two very robust dryers in the commercial version and a web chiller versus the publishing version just has a single dryer. We don't need to extract nearly the same amount of water if you're not painting the sheet. But like I said, the web width is 20 and a half inches. Uh, it's gonna run at 500 or it does run at 500 feet per minute, no matter what quality setting. We don't have to slow the web down for anything. If you got something that's, you know, 50% coverage, it, it doesn't make a difference. You might get some web wave in it, but um, 
And then we'll go up to an 11 point, which is pretty unique in this, in this category. Most people top it about a nine point for, uh, uh, for an inkjet web press. And then we manufacture this with an open architecture on the front end and the back end. So we can integrate into almost anybody's converting or finishing. Um, a lot of, especially with what's going on with paper, we're seeing a lot of people um, pre-coating their own rolls now instead of looking for inkjet optimized uh, coated stock. Um, and we work with, you know, Conti Web, Hunk, I, you name it. <clears throat> so there's really three key points. We have the lowest cost of inks in the industry. Um, if I look at even retail price to retail price, the next lowest competitor is $10 a liter more expensive than we are. Um, our gamut on this press is huge. Um, and then we can do, we manufacture our own uh, pre-coat for offset stocks. Uh, so if you do put a pre-coater on the front of it, it's, you know, we said 45 cents per thousand A4s dramatically less expensive than, you know, ordering an inkjet optimized substrate. And I talked about pre and post a little bit, but you name it. I mean, there's a bazillion potential configurations with this going into a, you know, pre post coder unwinder. Um, we designed one where we're putting a turn bar off the end of it. So it'll come in uh, to do a cut stack or a, a slit cut stack for book blocks, but then can divert off of this uh, L bar back in, into a rewinder um, if they weren't going directly into finishing. So there's a lot of flexibility uh, downline for the converting. And that's about it for inkjet. Any questions, guys, or folks, ladies, gentlemen, on the line, or do you want me to move on to the toner-based press? I like interactive stuff. Yeah, if there's any questions, any please raise your hand. Or, um, you can unmute yourself. Uh, this is a this is really a great presentation. I, I like the different pre and post production uh, configurations that you can really customize it to your shop. Terry. Yeah, is it all? You're saying it's uncoated stocks, and yet you have a pre pre coder and a post coder. Is the post coating? What's the post coating doing? Just protecting it, or what? Protecting. What kind of yeah, we find it for direct mail. I mean, on, on glossy papers, direct mail, you're going to want to put something uh, on top of that print to protect it from the mail stream. Is there usually stock, it's a UV? Is there any stocks out there that are coated so you don't have to add a pre coder, or do you still recommend it? I know it's a million dollar that. question. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? And it, <laughs> And it is about a million dollar question if you're talking to CompuWeb. Um, we recommend it quite a bit. There's a couple of reasons. It, it improves image quality some or quite a bit. Um, for anything that's coded, you can find inkjet optimized coded stocks where they've basically put a pre-treat or a coating down at the mill. Um, that like true jet and things like that, that's getting harder and harder to find at the mill. So we're seeing even in our current customer base, customers opting to put some sort of a pre-code on and controlling it themselves versus feeling like they're more held hostage uh, by the paper industry. And that might not have been politically correct to say, but um, yeah. So what, what kind of machines are you targeting to replace with this are you like osays or i mean what which what's the kind of the market where you're coming in at? yeah that's a great question we see an opportunity in some offset conversion um probably not the highest amount i look at this as a replacement machine for the hpt 240 series um there's a lot of screen true jets that went in the market seven, eight years ago where the volume has built up to a point uh, that they're looking for additional capacity. And, and this, you know, if I look at this, one shift 
one shift at 70% available capacity is going to produce somewhere just south of 17 million A4 equivalents a month. So the top end capacity on this thing, and I, I'm, I'm, I do it all on 70% availability. If you ran three shifts five days a week, it's about 64 million. So the volume, I mean, part of it, the volume has got to be there. Um, I, sorry, there's some little kids behind me and I got earphones on. So, um, the volume's kind of got to be there. 8 million A4 impressions a month is usually where the conversation starts. The, the, the economies of scale don't start to tip in favor of the customer until they can drive that 8 million to 10 million A4 impressions towards a device like this. Or it's got to have real high ink coverage work because we'll make up the difference on the ink coverage because our ink cost is lower. Does that make sense? Yeah, so is it still like a click consumable or is it just consumables? Consumable and base maintenance contract. And then, uh, you know, the, the one thing with inkjet is you've always got inkjet heads, right? Um, we do a refurbishment program with our inkjet heads instead of, hey, if they die, you're on the hook for, you know, whatever, whatever a head costs. I, I remember I was, at, I was at one shop and uh, the guy was running a white format Durst and he had a head strike and I thought the operator was going to start crying because it was like a $5,000 head replacement. Um, we just do it on a refurb program. So you have, the customer would have several heads on the shelf. So there's a degradation. So Other we questions? You, we lost you there. Oh, I cut out. You're back. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Sorry. No worries. Any other questions for the um, on the inkjet side of things? Okay. Yeah. Carry on. So, and I will clue you guys in that there we are releasing another inkjet press next week, um, and I'll kind of give you the high level overview. Our Prosper 6000 press was the fastest inkjet press in the industry for several years that had the ability to run up to a thousand feet per minute on uncoated stock. Um, we've, we've juiced that press up and that press will run at 1325 feet per minute uncoated. Uh, and we're releasing that press as well worldwide next week. Um, I've got one, we have one manufactured on our floor in our inkjet facility in Dayton, Ohio, sitting right next to the Ultra 520. Um, uh, sorry, I keep getting bogged here. Um, but we're going to re re release that worldwide as well next week. So that's really geared publishing, direct mail transactional type of applications. Uses a little bit different in jet head technology. So the, the droplet size is a little bit bigger. It's about nine picoliter droplet size versus the, the, the drops on this are small, three picoliters, so very small, which allows us to get to that increased resolution um, up to 1800 on that. Uh, uh, the 7,000 is like six by six, so. I will move on to the next. So we're releasing next week a, an interesting entry into the cut sheet drying space. And th this press is geared directly at two sub industries within the printing industry. And one's retail like POP, narrow width signage, a lot of that stuff that you would see indoors. And I've got some examples. And the other area this really serves would be light packaging. And I would almost call it boutique-like packaging because of some of the embellishment effects that are available on this press. So I'm gonna kind of walk through this. You know, we looked at some of the challenges in the packaging industry. 
the labor shortage, short run congestion, cost of production, and time consuming for embellishments. Um, I look at that narrow width indoor signage and I know, I know how most people run that work. It's usually on a flatbed, wide format, UV type press. They're printing or stepping up multiple, whatever they are, you know, 12 inch by six inch signs, taking them to a Colex rotary die cutter or Zun laser cutter, cutting those things out, throwing away a bunch of matrix, stacking them up out the door. And it takes a while to do. Um, wide format's not fast. And the cost of UV ink is not inexpensive either. And then we, in the signage industry, same, typically the same type of thing. So in packaging, I mean, this is a, any one of these conferences I go to, people talk about two areas in the business that are experiencing massive growth and packaging is always one of them. Labels seem to be the other one people talk about quite a bit. Um, all the projections is, it, is it's gonna continue to grow um, in packaging. We see it as a very promising market and it's high value work, especially when you get to the boutique things with embellishment. Uh, with retail POP, um, same things. These are examples of you know, signs that would fit the format out of this press and be able to manufacture at a fraction of the cost of doing it on wide format. Um, once again, this is a growing area there's not too many manufacturers that I think have directly addressed this area. And with this press, you'll be able to do what I call medium width signage. Um, I talked about embellishments and there's gonna be a very interesting function of this press and it's gonna be the ability to print CMYK and then a specialty foil dry ink in a single pass. Uh, that foil dry ink is gonna allow, for lack of better term, that company to be able to sleek foil onto that, onto that sheet without ever having to rerun it back through the engine. So in, in today's process, typically what happens on the top is you're gonna print black ink or black toner Right, then you're going to go to a laminator. It's going to reheat the black toner. You're going to sleek then whatever your foil is. Then you're going to go back on press and print CMYK. The challenge with that is, is you've already shrunk the sheet. So now you, you typically registration becomes a challenge on the reprint of the CMYK. You're typically going to have to choke a lot of things down within the file. You might have to stretch them. Re registration becomes a challenge. In our process, it's CMYK with the foil enabling ink, go right into the laminator and you're sleeking the foil down. One of the big benefits there is I don't have to do any knockouts then. I can lay that, that foil dry ink right on top of the CMYK image. So I don't have to worry about the trapping or the white space around it. So what is this thing? Um, it's the Kodak Ascend. Uh, this is using a, a new dry ink formulation from Kodak. It's the first time we'll have a, a press that uses no fuser oil in the imaging. Um, it's five color engine, so it's five independent stations, CMYK plus a fifth. Um, this will feed up to a 48 inch sheet. Um, has the ability to put white ink in, in it right now. Um, White ink can be put in the second position on the press. By early next year, we'll be able to put white in the first. So if you wanted to do backlit signage, um, you could hit it with white and then overprint CMYK on top of it. Uh, the width, the paper width is 14.2 inches or the board width. And this will feed up to a 30 point board. So we've done a lot of things. If anybody's ever seen our existing Next Press or Nextfinity, it's it's the same chassis that's tried and true that was co-developed with Heidelberg. We've straightened out the 
the paper path, if you will, um, to eliminate before there's a pretty big bend coming out of the extended sheet feeder that we've, we've flattened that bend out. And then there's been a big redesign on all of the imaging systems and also the fuser section to accommodate such a thick board. Uh, this is a marketing slide. I hate these when they pop up, but um, <clears throat> registration centers in, in the front with a, it's a three point registration. So a buckle with a side guide. So we're registering the front and side of every sheet that comes through. Um, interchangeable imaging systems. One of our claims to fame has always been how fast it is to change a fifth station out. So if I wanted to add, let's say, gamma expansion color of red, um, it's literally seven minutes to change out that fifth station. And then if I wanted to put white in, it's seven minutes. It, you're actually waiting for the fuser to warm up more than it is the physical change out of the componentry. And this is kind of cool. We, we put... I don't know if that's a, a some form of a tablet on board with this thing that you can call up training videos. Um, you can engage our technical support team directly through this if there's questions from the operator standpoint. Um, more proactive approach to maintaining the device or if there's questions. So I touched on most of this stuff. It's we'll run a 30 point board, no slowdown in the press. Um, the, what we would call the duty cycle is up to 4 million uh, A4 equivalents a month. Um, lots of different embellishment effects. And I've got a list of all those. And then the new inks that, that we developed, the Kodachrome dry inks. Um, I, the gamut is larger than our prior uh, cut sheet digital presses with the, the, the new ink set that we have. So we're real excited about that. From a productivity standpoint, this thing will produce 7,200 A4 sheets um, per hour, <clears throat> very high image resolution and image quality. And in terms of reliability, I mean, we the, that the chassis being co-developed with Heidelberg has been around and it's tried and true. Uh, this is a piece of iron. It's not a fl fast plastic piece of equipment whatsoever. So from an increase in productivity, the productivity gateway, which is, is the tablet that, that's on board with the device, um, it will give you analytics about uptime, um, how many sheets have been through the press uh, between operator, um, operator and event intervention. I'll have training and support videos. You'll be able to contact our technical team directly through it. Um, our philosophy from a, a, a user standpoint is really our operator replaceable components or ORCs. Um, I believe there's a slide that shows the, the inside of the press in this presentation, but it's very offset in heritage where there's an imaging cylinder, there's a true blanket cylinder, if you will. Uh, so a plate and a blanket, and that blanket is transferring one color down to the sheet, which is why we can move colors around so easily. We're not building the entire CMYK image on a single blanket and transferring that to the sheet. It's going black to sheet, cyan to the sheet, magenta to the sheet, et cetera. So it, it looks like a five color offset press internally. Um, Jeff, there was a question in the chat. Um, someone had asked, I don't know if that was Mark, um, uh, 7,200 sheets printed one side or two? One side. Okay, great. Sim, 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 yeah, simplex productivity, 7,200 per hour. Yep. So this is what I just, I told you we had a picture of this. This is just what I was going through with the imaging cylinder and the blanket cylinder. And then the sheet is actually writing on the transport lab. So if you can see inside of this, that's five independent imaging, imaging stations, each one transferring a color down to the sheet. 
very unique. Most, almost every other competitor builds the entire MSIK plus onto the sheet. And that's what is allowing us to move colors around it within the press. So if I want to put white after the first of the year, if I want to put white in the first and then have CMYK follow behind it, that's possible. So I can do a single pass, hit with white and a build with CMYK. Unlike if I looked at an indigo, you're going to pound that thing with white to get your opacity, then come back through and print CMYK on top of it. These are all the specialty inks that we have, or what we call embellish, embellishment inks. We have about 13 right now. Um, everything from the, I'm sorry, 14, from the foil, opaque, white, gold, dimensional. So we can actually build um, some dimensional print up on, on the, up on the sheet. We can build to about 14 to 16 microns to give it texture. Um, antimicrobial, believe it or not, giant hit at the height of COVID, um, especially with uh, some folks printing uh, menus for the few restaurants that were open. Um, three different gamut expansion colors. We've got Micker, um, a spot, uh, spot clear. Oh, yeah. And so, I mean, the intent of this press, when we designed it, was really to target two high demand markets with that POP signage group. And then, you know, light packaging that, that requires embellishment um, with a low cost of operation to allow for more margins uh, for our customers. Um, 30 points, very unique. Uh, to this group of presses. I mean, most of them are topping out at 24 point right now. Um, 30 points, pretty thick board. Uh, the Kodachrome dry inks, it's non-hazardous, uh, very sustainable and uh, recyclable, environmentally friendly. Um, and then a very low co running cost behind this thing. Um, two different service models. We can look at a click-based model or uh, more of an operator shared service model um, where it's a base maintenance and then parts are included. Um, the customer buys the ORCs, the consumables, and then the supplies with the dry ink. That's all I got, Wendy. Great. Thank you so much, Jeff. This is uh, yeah. really informative. Um, we'll open up the uh, open up the floor for any other questions. I know there was a couple of questions that came in as we were going along and um, open and open that up. Uh, one question that I have, and, and you yeah. know, I, I'm not on the production side of print. So this is something I was just curious about. You mentioned that um, it was cheaper to run POP signage off of the Ascend than a kind of a traditional wide format setup. And I'm just curious what would be the, um, the difference? Why would, why would that be the case? Because I know wide format's kind of been the, the direction that a lot of companies are sure. going for printing signage. Um, the cost of dry ink is a lot less than the cost of UV ink. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that bottom line, toner costs a heck of a lot less than uh, UV ink on a wide format device. When I sold wide format a couple of years ago, you know, it it was probably 95 cents, 75 to 95 cents a square foot just in UVA before capital and labor. I mean, you you guys know an eight and a half by 11 click charge or 13 by 19 click charge for almost anybody out there I mean, the benchmark is 3.5 cents or less. Uh, so there is a huge, huge variance in manufacturing costs. And as long as that format width is less than 14 inches, I mean, this would be something that I would look strongly at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, that's, that's really helpful. Um, and um, does anyone else have any 
Any questions, John? So, um, Jeff, could you talk a little bit about um, why you would make a decision to take a toner product and why you would make a decision to make an inkjet product? So, um, you know, you have both of them uh, and they, you know, they do different things. And, um, you know, we all kind of hear a lot about inkjet, yet toner is certainly not going away, uh, which tends to believe that there's a place for it. Um, so could you talk a little bit about the whole toner inkjet piece, you know, quality, substrates, yeah. all the kind of things that go into the decision of which kind of technology is going to be right for you, depending on the application? Yeah, that's a great question, John, because it's, it's a talker constantly, especially when we're talking about, you know, our cut sheet, dry toner, dry ink based product, um, everybody has investigated cut sheet inkjet at some point, whether it's uh, the KM1, the Kamori IS-29. Um, I think Canon came a long ways with uh, their new IX uh, inkjet platform over the I-300. Um, and then you've really got the Fuji J press, right? So, you know, to me, there's in the cut sheet inkjet world, cut sheet, not roll, cut sheet. There's three, three players there. Um, the Canon IX, Konicum Nolta KM1, um, and then Fuji with the J-Press. All of them do some things really well, um, all of them, but they don't do everything, right? If you have, you know, print-on-demand applications where you have to get from multiple pick points in a run, let's say I'm doing uh, book blocks and I want to pull covers with it or tabs, or I wanna stack up a bunch of work and just let the press run and have multiple different substrates. Um, with all those presses, but the IX, you're, you're dealing with one lift, just like you would on press today. Um, and you're usually married to a sheet size. Um, 2329 on the KM1, um, there's some good things about that sheet. I, I, there's also some things that, that don't make sense. Um, there can be a lot of wastage on that sheet. Our, the, our positioning is print closer to the finished format size and eliminate wastage. I mean, if I'm printing eight and a half by 11 work because we charge off of, an, off of an A4 click, why would I step something up on a 13 inch sheet? You're gonna be just as productive on our press printing two up on a 13 inch sheet as you are gonna be printing eight and a half by 11. Um, there's an argument to be made about, you know, and no one likes to print business cards. I certainly don't, but there's an argument to be made if you're gonna print business cards digitally, <clears throat> why step them up on such a big sheet because you risk front to back registration with tail whip on a lot of devices. I mean, if, if the cost structure by the manufacturer's positioned right, it, it, it can be advantageous for the printer to print closer to finish size. It's all about how they structured the, the cost of it. Um, ink, the other thing I would say, John, around inkjet is you got to feed the beast there. I mean, someone who's doing a couple hundred thousand, eight and a half by 11 a month, that fixed asset cost is going to kill them compared to the gains that they're gonna get either from the manufacturing costs or the productivity. Um, you know, I, if I'm gonna think of a million two or a million or $750,000 into something, that, that's a lot of capital. Um, I'd want something that was as versatile as possible. Uh, do you also feel that the quality on your um, on your Prosper ink jets is the same as the quality on the toner presses? Ah, great question. Um, dang close on the 520. Um, that 200 line screen equivalent is awful impressive. Um, we just did a photo book for a potential customer. Um, and I put them up against our next Finity toner base output and 
ink looks different than toner, obviously, but from a quality standpoint, they were very, very, very similar. Once I get a loop out, I can tell quickly, but you know, from a foot away, it was good. The Prosper 6,000, 7,000, the image quality is not quite as good. It's still very saleable output, um, but you don't have nearly high enough resolution. And the picoliter droplet size being bigger doesn't lend itself to being as sharp. Great, excellent questions. Uh, uh, so um, does anyone else have any questions I'd like to ask Jeff? Um, this is a really great opportunity to um, pick his brain about the industry, about the, um, the different digital options that are out there, why you might choose one over another. Rob, uh, Rob McPartland? Yeah, hi Jeff, uh, Rob McPartland from Ulithal. Right. We're coming, up, we're coming down, uh, what, the 18th or something like that. Will we see- um, Great, I look forward to meeting you. Yeah, will we see most of the equipment in, in production down there? You'll see it all. Okay. You'll see it all. You have an Xfinity. So, I, I'm not sure. Nextfinity will be there. So mm -hmm. the beginning of it, uh, we're gonna divide people up into groups and put them in front of each one of the new release products. So the Ascend, the Ultra 520, the 7000, and I think we've got a Magnus plate setter there. I think there'll be something around uh, Printergy also. Um, <clears throat> But in the afternoon, uh, you, you'll have an opportunity to, to arrange, you know, half an hour demonstrations on any of the products. Yeah, I think Xfinity, I think, I think, yeah. Yeah, signed up for it. Um, you were talking about the, the different colors available. Um, is silver one of them yet? That's a great question. You can make silver using metallic clear. Oh, okay. And I, and I can show you how to do that. I, I, I can show you how to do that. You know, when we did okay. sell it with the gold, it, it just didn't do it. And then the, the, the last question I have for you is, we know that the, the newer press, mine currently, I have to put my white in the first unit or, or any of the colors in the first unit. And you said you're gonna make them interchangeable. Is the next mini able to do a clear and a white or do we gotta stick with CMYK plus the fifth? In the next Finity right now, it's CMYK plus the fifth. Um, is there any reason since they're interchangeable? I haven't come up with being able to just do like. <laughs> it's a software <laughs> thing right now. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's a software thing right now. And with Nextfinity, because of the sensors that we use to register, I've got to have black there to register the sheet to the web. Okay. In the first position. Um, cameras perhaps in the future would allow us to put white or another another color there to be and still maintain the same registration but those sensors are looking for black yeah i mean obviously white down first is so much <laughs> i i'd love to i've been wanting white in the first for two and a half years and i'm gonna get my way i think in 2023 so i probably started before you then <laughs> what's that i probably started before you because i wanted as soon as the nrd said yeah in the case. yeah Great. Um, Rob, that's great. You're going to go get some, get a demo. Um, any other questions or, um, and Jeff, maybe you can tell us about how members could, uh, you know, could do that, um, get a schedule a demo. Also, um, the, all of the codec equipment is included in the Graphic Arts Alliance incentive program. So that is just something yep. um, to let everyone know. We just recently in the beginning of the year did sign an additional addendum to our codec contract that the Prosper, that covers the Prosper and the Ascend as well. So we're really excited to be able to include that in our codec program going forward. And one of the reasons I wanted to have Jeff come and, and just kind of highlight some of these things for us today. Sure. Um, Jeff, do you any way that people can reach out and schedule demos? Yeah. Easiest way would be get a hold of me. Um, email address is jeff.perkins at kodak.com. Pretty simple. Um, our demo facility is in Dayton, Ohio. And it, it, it's an interesting facility because it's also where we do all our inkjet R&D and manufacturing. So it's a, it's a manufacturing facility that's got a, a showroom attached to it, if you will. Um, but yeah, anybody's welcome to 
to uh, thank you for doing that, Wendy, uh, to reach out to me. Great. Wonderful. Any other last questions for Jeff before we let him uh, get on his flight back home? <laughs> Wonderful. Well, Jeff, thank you again for taking Thanks, the time, everybody. especially in the middle of your travels here. I know you're just uh, always on the road. So we were happy to catch you at least for this, this little bit of time with you. And certainly um, if anyone has any questions, wanted to know how to reach Jeff, obviously I put his email address in the chat box there for you. If you had any other further questions, you're welcome to reach me. I can put you in touch with Jeff or contact him directly. But uh, thank you again for coming today. Happy June. And thank hope you. you're all enjoying your summer, start of your summer. And um, yeah, stay safe, stay, stay cool. And um, Jeff, safe travels. There you go. I put my cell number in there too. Beautiful. All right. Great. Thanks so much, everybody. I appreciate the time. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week. Take care. Bye. Bye.